So with that, uh, enjoy Paul, and thank you for being here, and I think you'll love his talk. Thank you, Paul. I'll take Thank you. If you're wondering why Tom is talking so fast, and I will too, we have a marching band coming in at 10 o'clock, and apparently we can't slow them down. So I'm super honored to be here. Um, I hope I expand your horizons of your imagination and give you also practical tools for you to improve your life and that of your children and your friends and your family. So my talk is going to be all-encompassing. Uh, I live, walk, and breathe and eat this subject literally every day. Um, so I want to first give you my disclosures. I am the founder and sole owner of Fungi Perfecti, maker of uh, host defense. I have 145 wonderful co-workers. Um, I've co-founded a Micromedica Life Sciences. It's on a pharma path uh, for primarily focused on uh, psilocybin uh, and antivirals. We have a nonprofit called the Center for Ecological Consciousness. I have seven books. I'm 208 pages into my next book on psilocybin, uh, which should be out next year by Random House and Penguin. Um, and I recently have received my second uh, DEA license for uh, possession of, uh, and study of psilocybin. I'd like to say I passed my background checks. <laughs> Woohoo! But I'm so proud that Fungi Perfecta and Host Defense is a certified B Corp. And now we are climate positive scope one, two, and three. Now for you that don't know what scope one, two, and three, means the scope one is your direct uh, carbon emissions resulting from manufacturing. Scope two is indirect emissions in the form of energy, et cetera, heating your facilities. And scope three is the most comprehensive, upstream and downstream. We are returning 110%. We're climate positive. 10% more carbon is sequestered every single time a customer purchases a product. They're sequestering carbon. How many companies in this room are scope three? How many companies in this room are scope two? How many companies in this room are scope one? This is extraordinary. I challenge this industry in 10 years for 50% of you to be scope three certified. It is time for you to give back to the commons and sequester carbon. It's important that we walk our talk as an industry and send a message and set a standard for the next generation. We're all on this earth ship together and we need to protect our climate and our e ecosystems for future generations. I want to acknowledge some of my primary mentors, Dr. Daniel Stuntz, Kit Skates, Michael View, and Alexander Smith. I want to acknowledge my father, my brother John, and my mother, all whom have now passed on. These mentors in my life taught me some of the principles that I follow and espouse. My compass is governed by the principles of kindness, courage, strength, and wisdom. I take the Aikido approach when I face business opportunities and strategies. I feel it's so important for us to demonstrate these four principles because even though they did not teach you at Harvard Business School, the return on investment on being kind to other people is reciprocated many, many times over. So in this industry, Cooperation is so much more important than competition. So let's talk about the role of mycelium and mushrooms in the ecosystem. Mushroom and mycelium infuse all habitats. Now there's been really a false controversy about labeling mushroom products. In the field of mycology, we say mushroom spores. In the field of science, we say mushroom spores. If we didn't say mushrooms before spores, there could be algae spores, there could be bacterial spores, there could be lungwort spores. With mycelium, if you didn't use mushrooms, there could be mold, mold mycelium. 
it is a false narrative, a false argument that is frankly perplexing to us scientists why this issue is even being elevated. It's similar with plants. Plant seeds, plant leaves, plant stems, plant roots. Of course you would have the qualifier before spores or mycelium, otherwise you create greater confusion. So this is what mycelium is. It comes from a mushroom. Mushrooms make mycelium, mycelium makes mushrooms. And the mycelial networks have enormous genetic potential for adapting to ecological change or challenges. The mushroom mycelium produces mushrooms, depending on the substrate, influences the, the morphology of the mushrooms. But here is really the take home slide, and you're welcome to photograph this. Many more genes are expressed at the mycelial state than the fruit body state. Why is that? Well, the mycelium is navigating through a hostile microbial environment, being, trying to be parasitized by other, other aggressive organisms. It upregulates immune factors to defend itself from uh, parasitization. So the mycelium, as a general statement, codes for a lot more genes than the fruit body. Actually, mushrooms rot quickly. The mycelium has an immune system that lasts for weeks, months, years, and fleshy mushrooms come up and rot in a matter of four or five days. They don't have a good immune system. The mycelium is the immune system of the organism. So looking at some of the literature that's been published, in, especially with lion's mane, it's the mycelium that has the most neurogenic uh, properties. There's multiple clinical studies showing that the mycelium codes for compounds that cause neural growth factors, that cause neurons to repair, regenerate, and regrow. This is a very, I think, illustrative example. That is a reishi mushroom on the right. You peel off the cap cuticle. What is there is mycelium. So the mycelium is compressed into a, the form of a mushroom, but the mushroom is mycelium. But the mycelium, we can scale. It has much more genes being activated. At the end of its life cycle, it compresses into the structure of a fruit body that releases spores. So we've been studying this subject for a long time. One of the subjects that I'm focused on, because I'm a beekeeper and I'm a mycologist, and I have beehives, and I had this epiphany that mushroom mycelium can help bees fight viruses. Colony collapse has swept the world, as many of you know. It's up to 50% loss of beehives, of Apis mellifera, the honeybee. We published this in Nature. One treatment of mushroom mycelium extracts of reishi mushrooms and amadou, which my hat is made of, reduces bee viruses, the deformed wing virus, by more than 879 times uh, with the Lake Sinai virus, a reishi, more than 45,000 times. One treatment 12 days later with a mushroom mycelium extract put into sugar water. This article in Nature is in the top 0.1% of all articles ever published in the Nature publication ecosystem. Nature of medicine, nature of physics, etc. Why? It's a first demonstration that a natural product can be more powerful than a pharmaceutical. We think it because of the entourage effect of upregulating the immunity so the endogenous immune system of the organism, bees, can be able to limit these viruses. This is a randomized clinical animal study done outdoors with beehives. But let's go back in time. The use of mushrooms goes back thousands of years, both in Europe and in China. Hippocrates first mentioned Amadou mushrooms, my hat is made of an Amadou mushroom as an anti-inflammatory, 400 plus BCE. Dioscorides mentioned agaricon, another mushroom we have spent an enormous amount of energy and focus. It's a mushroom that grows exclusively in the old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest and now in some sky islands in Europe. Less than 1% of those forests currently exist today. So not only the Greeks recognize this mushroom as being a strong medicinal mushroom, but the Haida people and the First Nations of the Pacific Northwest also recognized it as being a very important mushroom. And they, they, they carved the mushroom to little grave guardian figures that would help shamans go into the afterlife. Where does the Gairacon grow? It grows in these habitats. I propose to you 
that the old growth forests are genomic libraries of the enormous potential consequence and benefit for human immunity. It's sometimes very difficult to find these strains of agarokon. They can be hundreds of feet up into old growth trees. We have to climb them. And many of these forests have been cut, now burned. The loss of habitat is we're losing the genomic libraries of agarokon. Agarokon has been positioned as one of the longest living mushrooms in the world. The center photograph you see there is a mushroom that's approaching 100 years of age. The tree on the left is the largest spruce in Canada. There's an agarokon about two thirds up that tree. And there's a photograph of me from 1997, 1998. It just gives you an idea how long I've been collecting agarokon. In fact, we now are creating the largest library of agarokon in the world. And we take a small piece of tissue, we leave the agarokon mushrooms in the forest, unless it's going to be logged or threatened by fire, or the habitat's going to be destroyed for other reasons. Otherwise, we leave these intact. To harvest agarokon for medicinal purposes would be devastating against the genomic preservation of the species. By taking tissue cultures of mycelium, we can grow the mycelium while protecting the mushroom by leaving it there. So the agarokon mycelium that we have now, we have now 93 strains of agarokon approaching 100. Only one time out of 40 or 50 times in the old growth forest we will find these. So our genomic library, when we hit 100 strains, we're doing full gen genomic sequencing and we're populating a public database because we'll have the largest, we have the largest collection of agarokon by far in the world. Tens of thousands of hours, no exaggeration. It has taken for us to invest to find these rare strains and to bank them because many of the strains we have banked today, the forest no longer exists. Those phenotypes, those strains have become extinct had it not for us being able to get them in culture. The Karakon is now on the red list of threatened species in Europe. And even though this distribution may seem like it's been widely distributed, it once was. But now if we populated that map with locations, you'd see small little dots in, uh, throughout those countries. This species is becoming increasingly rare. Less than 50% sightings in the past 10 to 20 years. It's on the rapid descension to near extinction. The other focus of my life has been with psilocybin mushrooms. I would just leave you the caveat. You will be hearing a lot about agarokon in the near future. The other species that I've focused on a lot, as, as Tom mentioned, is psilocybin. I produced my first book on psilocybin mushrooms 45 years ago. When I was 23 years of age, I published my first field guide to psilocybin mushrooms. We started doing a series of conferences because at that time at the Evergreen State College, I was covered by a DEA license by Dr. Michael Bug and listed on the license. We could do these conferences and I could legally possess psilocybin, which is known as a schedule, schedule one drug. So at a time of high paranoia, we would do these conferences because I had the umbrella, legal umbrella, to possess psilocybin mushrooms. We could feel like we could promote the education and identification of psilocybin mushrooms, which very little people knew about at the time. Terence McKenna, many of you know of Terence, um, wrote a book called Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide with three other authors. It became a very popular book. I have seven books out, but Terence's book, by far the book on the right there, really swept the world because it showed people how to grow psilocybin mushrooms at home. We started doing a number of other conferences, and it's because I knew the scientists and, and the psychedelic uh, uh, the psychedelic experts, but I was also good friends with Ken Kesey, the Grateful Dead, and their Merry Pranksters. So I realized I had this intersection of these cultural heroes and also these scientists, so we brought them together through this amazing mushroom conference in 1999, the Millennium Mushroom Conference. 
So how many species of psilocybin mushrooms have been identified so far? More than 141 species of psilocybin mushrooms, circumpolar, over 5,600 collections since the, uh, the 1800s. This is really important that people understand. This is very different than peyote. Psilocybin mushrooms are diverse. They grow all over the world. They don't grow in the old growth forest, except for one or two species. They seem to be associated with human migration and human activity. I have honored, I have been able to publish four new species of psilocybin mushrooms, and a few months ago, I have a new psilocybin mushroom species named after me called Psilocybe stomesii, <laughs> which in the field of mycology is a big deal, okay? <clears throat> it's such a cute little mushroom, too. It's got this little wavy nipple at the top, which I like. So there's no doubt that we all came from Africa. And 15 to 20,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, humans, colonized the Americas. Now, colonization is a very pejorative term these days. But from a scientist's point of view, migration of species colonizes new habitats. The majority of plants in your garden, your grasses, they're not native to North America. They were imported. So with the migration of humans carries knowledge and practices, you meet friend or foe on the trail, on the path. You share with them the tools that can help them be better and stronger and better survive. So let's look at some of the historical echoes in the archaeological record suggesting the use of psilocybin mushrooms. The famous Tassili cave art in northern Africa, southern, uh, um, um, uh, in, uh, in, in the southern Algeria, 7,000 years before present. Then there's a cave art in Spain um, that also is associated with cattle that has mushrooms showing up uh, in the bottom of this pictograph. And then in Greek culture, the Eleusinian mysteries speak of Demeter giving Persephone a mushroom before she goes into the underworld. And this, be, and this also illustrates the origination myth of the seasons in Greek culture. So recently, I went to Egypt. And we visited 10 temples. While everyone else is looking at the great pictographs, of its temples, etc., I went mushroom hunting. <laughs> so we went to 10 temples. At every single temple, we found mushroom hieroglyphics. And I want to give credit to my friend here, uh, Azim. Uh, he is the first one who published this in 2016, that the Egyptians likely used psilocybin mushrooms. And this is the temple uh, uh, Dendera, which is the, one of the driest regions of the world today because of climate change. And so Hathor, who's the goddess of cosmetics, of beauty, also the goddess of cows, interestingly. She is associated with a mushroom, and the mushroom is classically has the phenotype, the appearance of Psilocybe cubensis. Now, you look down below, and there is another mushroom um, that is associated with the blue lotus. The blue lotus is considered to be sacred in Egyptian culture, and the color is gold and blue. And here you see falcons sitting upon the mushrooms, which signifies spirit going into the afterlife. And we found pictographs throughout the temples. Several thousand years ago, the Nile Delta region was moist, had deciduous trees, alluvial plains. It was rich. Climate change now, when we went to, to along the Nile, literally between this stage and the street out, outside, it was desert. Such a thin band of vegetation now surrounds the Nile. So we didn't find one or two or three hieroglyphics. We found dozens. 
showing this to one Egyptologist, he goes, no, those are shovels. They're not shovels, folks. <laughs> These are mushrooms. And it speaks to the fact that when you have experts not skilled in one field, they can't see that which is hiding in plain sight. In fact, it's not hiding, it's apparent. The reason why I think this is highly significant is because the mushrooms of Psilocybe cubensis are golden in color and they turn blue. So this golden blue predominance in Egypt, Egyptology, I think speaks to the fact that more than one thing can be true. The blue lotus is a water lily. Cattle go to the ponds to drink. This mushroom is quite substantial. It's a very large mushroom. Obviously, the Egyptians collecting water lilies, the blue lotus, would encounter Psilocybe cubensis. Mushrooms were banned by Egyptian royalty to be picked by the peasants, by the commoners. But more interestingly also, is Cleopatra was a lover of Caesar's and Mark Anthony. Now, Mark Anthony was 20 years younger than Caesar, but Cleopatra funded the Roman army at a time when they did not have enough in their treasury. So you're there with your lover, the highest ranks of society. Wouldn't you share the Eleusinian mysteries if you're coming from that culture? Wouldn't you share the, 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 the activity of the Blue Lotus combined with Psilocybe Cubensis? Of course you would. So look how close these regions were, or are today. The Sicily cave art in Algeria, the Spanish cave art that I showed you, the Eleusinian mysteries in Greece and in Egypt. There was a lot of cross-cultural communication. Now, at the time of the Eleusinian mysteries, 2,000 years ago, they persisted for almost 1,500 years. Sophocles, Aristotle, Plato, all partook of the Eleusinian mysteries, which involved eating or drinking a mushroom or a fungus concoction that sent them into a spiritual state of being. On the other side of the planet, in the New World, the Aztecs also were recorded by the Spaniards of ingesting psilocybin mushrooms. They combined it with honey and chocolate. And interesting to me is the Bavarian Beer Act in Europe, about the same time, banned the mushrooms from beer. When you put mushrooms in honey to preserve it, as is commonly practiced even today, you create a mushroom mead, a psychoactive beer. So it's really extraordinary to me on two sides of the world, relatively at the same time, we have documentation of mushrooms being used as inebriants for spiritual purposes. But we must give credit to Maria Sabina, the great Mazatec shaman who opened up her home and showed R. Gordon and Valentina Wasson, you know, some of the secrets of the Mazatec culture using psilocybin mushrooms. This was published in Life magazine, May 13, 1957. And also, in, in, um, Tina Watson also published it about simultaneously in a Utah um, magazine. But Arguin Watson was not a mycologist. Tina Watson was. She knew the mushrooms by Latin but, uh, binomials. She knew how to identify them. Well, Maria Sabina also was a mycologist. These two great women opened up the doors for many of us who are, that now are standing on their shoulders of knowledge. Psilocybe cubensis came from Africa, and it looks like it appeared in the Americas with the arrival of the Spanish and the conquistadors. Now there is a, unfortunately, people not really knowledgeable about this subject who politicize and create divides and controversies that don't need to exist. Maria Sabina used three species primarily, Psilocybe serulescens, Psilocybe aziticorum, and Psilocybe mexicana. She did not use Psilocybe cubensis. It was called San Isidro, the saint of the fields in Catholicism. And they disdained Psilocybe cubensis because it was associated with the Spanish. What has happened now because of the surge in interest in psilocybin mushrooms, the Mazatecs cannot collect wild psilocybin mushrooms in their habitats. So what are they using? They're using Psilocybe cubensis. They're using a, a mushroom associated 
with the migration, the colonization of Spanish coming to the Americas is now become sustainable for their Mazatec practices that they have a sustainable supply of psilocybin mushrooms because Philosophy cubensis can be grown and cultivated. Those other three species I mentioned are very difficult to cultivate. So I want to bring you to an essential concept of building bridges, not divides. And I want to give credit to Albert Marshall, who, who came up with the phrase of two-eyed seeing. When challenged by a mother who said to Albert, why should I send my indigenous children to a school that teaches Western education? Albert said, because we need two-eyed seeing. One eye informed with indigenous wisdom, the other eye informed with Western technology. Growing philosophy convinces for the Mazatecs and making it available to them for their indigenous practices is an example of two-eyed seeing. Moreover, my friend Melissa Nelson, some of you know her, she runs the Conservancy Seed uh, Exchange in Sevastopol, California. She's half Irish and half Chippewa. Many indigenous people are mixed blood. They're not going to deny their heritage. But she came up with a phrase of re-indigenization. How many threads of knowledge have been broken over time because of disease, famine, religious domination, climate change? It's amazing we have this knowledge today. So re-indigenization is to be able to empower indigenous peoples and their practices by offering them psilocybin mushrooms in this case that can help them continue. And tr indigenous traditions are never static. They're constantly improving and, and changing. I was in Anchorage, Alaska. I went to the most impressive indigenous museum I've, I've been at, First Peoples. It was fantastic. And at the very end of the exhibit, with the Inuits, they were hunting seals. And the last photograph was on a snowmobile with binoculars and a rifle. Those are Western technologies. It's an example, again, of two-eyed seeing. So a lot of my indigenous elder friends, we're a voice now for building of bridges across indigenous cultures, only if they ask, only if they ask, and we respect their traditions, can we help offer them sustainable solutions so they can continue. This is so important for all of us. We need to build bridges, not divisions. So many states now are decriminalizing or legalizing psilocybin. California, many of you heard, 42 to 11 in the legislature approved the decriminalization and legal possession of psilocybin up to one ounce. Of course, you've heard about Oregon and Colorado. This is sweeping, not only the United States and Canada, it's sweeping the world right now. And there's very good reasons for this. There was first a series of meta-studies that came out, in this case, prisoners, 485,000 prisoners surveyed. Statistically significant association with one psilocybin experience and a decreased odds of larceny, property crime, and violent crime. Oh, well, you can say, well, association is not causation, but it can be. So that's an interesting data point. It's a meta-analysis, observational study, retroactive. Another study comes out. 1,266 community members. Psilocybin was the, uh, and LSD were statistically associated with a decrease in partner-to-partner -partner violence. Think of that. I always thought if it was a dating app, have you tripped on psilocybin? Yes. Oh, okay. Move forward. If you haven't, well, more dangerous people. Stay away from them. So. Then opioid use disorder. Also, psilocybin was the only psychedelic associated with lower odds of opioid, opioid use disorder. How many people in this room have family, friends, or neighbors that have been affected by opioid use? Could you raise your hand? It's the majority of us. It's affected me and my family. 
You don't want to talk about bad news to your friends, your family. But if someone does psilocybin and suddenly breaks their addiction to opioids, it does become newsworthy. You want to spread good news. People fundamentally change. Nature relatedness. Another observational study. Those who've had one experience with psilocybin tend to be more aware of the environment, more pro-ecological. As of yesterday, there's 130 clinical trials on psilocybin registered at clinicaltrials.gov. 10 years ago, there was one. Harvard, Stanford, the best universities across the world, they're going past IRB boards and, and institutional review boards. They're, they're being vetted by scientists. They're addressing a critical need that other medicines are not addressing. So this is extraordinary that so many scientists, because every one of these studies has a panel of physicians and researchers that are vetting their research to make sure harm is minimized, addressing a critical need, high probability of a substantial improvement. But the clinical trials with psilocybin have a really hard problem. When you put it into the placebo double-blind controlled model, which is the gold standard for doing clinical trials, and I cannot illustrate this better than this cartoon, <laughs> two different patient cohorts, <laughs> one group at the placebo, <laughs> and uh, the other group did not. So a placebo is not supposed to be detectable by the patient population. And of course, in 20 minutes, for those of you who have not done psilocybin, you have liftoff, you clearly know that you've got the active ingredient. Well, psilocybin is known to increase neuroplasticity and homological crosstalk between neural networks. And this is what's so exciting for a neuroscientist is looking at how psilocybin can lead to neurogenesis to fight neurodegenerative diseases. So there are several double-blind placebo-controlled studies for depression. The verdict is out, folks. We don't need any more psilocybin studies on depression. It is in the JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the New England Journal of Medicine, these studies are very, very compelling that it shows that psilocybin can treat PTSD and depression and relieve anxiety. And during this COVID crisis, you can imagine, you know, those factors have substantially increased across the general population. So let's look at some of the addictive substances that psilocybin has been studied for. Long-term follow-up of using psilocybin for ceasing tobacco smoking. Two sessions, several weeks apart, 67% of the people one year later were not smoking cigarettes. Think of that. You've been smoking cigarettes most of your adult life, you're addicted, nothing has worked. One six hour experience, maybe two, followed by therapy, and the common refrain by the patients is they look at the cigarettes and they go, I don't need those. Why am I smoking them? And they cold turkey stop smoking cigarettes within a week. One of the most addictive substances known. Binge drinking. Also, statistically significant reduction in binge drinking. Double blind placebo controlled. There are many other studies of those 130 studies that I showed at clinicaltrials.gov, and there are recruitments going on for many of these clinical studies today. So many of you may know someone who's addicted to alcohol, cigarettes, you know, and other substances, opioids. Go to clinicaltrials.gov and see if they're enlisting. They need to have the patients enrolled that under strict criteria so they can further refine these studies. So I'm going to talk about microdosing. Now psilocybin, psilocybin commences at 1% has about 10 milligrams of psilocybin. 
A microdose is one-tenth of a liftoff dose, of a perceptual dose. So 10 milligrams is a liftoff dose, so a microdose is one milligram, about one-tenth of a gram of psilocybin commences. I'll go say that again. One gram of psilocybin commences is 10 milligrams. One-tenth of a gram of psilocybin commences is one milligram. I describe microdosing as non-intoxicating. Some people said it's perceptual, but when I microdose, I, I feel happier, color's a little brighter, I'm in a better mood, I'm more tolerant, so it's perceptual. But it's not intoxicating. It's not like you slammed a beer and you got a little buzz rise for an hour. Microdosing has no perceptual intoxication. So we started doing some surveys and we enlisted a group called Quantified, Quantified Citizen in Vancouver, British Columbia. And we came out with an app to measure what the behavior is of people microdosing. And you see in the one-tenth to one-third of a gram, 88% of the people microdosing were in that range. Now, I suggested something of stacking psilocybin microdosing with lion's mane mycelium. The idea was psilocybin, I believe, um, back in 2000, in the mid-2000s, causes neurogenesis. But psilocybin is a vasoconstrictor. Niacin is a vasodilator. And then lion's mane regrows the myelin sheath on the axons of the nerves. So I thought the combination of psilocybin microdosing with lion's mane and niacin could have an entourage effect in increasing neurogenesis and performance. Neuropathies oftentimes present themselves as a constriction of the vascular system and a deadening of the nerves at the fingertips and the toes. So I thought by adding niacin, its flushing form, it excites the nervous system, as all of you know, it itches. You, you, at high doses, over 50 milligrams, you flush red. It's a vasodilator. So the idea is to have vasodilations of the endpoints of the vascular nervous system to deliver the neurogenic benefits of psilocybin and lion's mane. So we conducted the largest global microdosing study in the world. We have over 25,000 people currently reporting. And this microdosing study has all been vetted. It's anonymized. You own your own data. You code in. It's gone through ethics review by medical institutions. Ask you how much you're microdosing with. What are you combining it with? Are you combining it with lion's mane, niacin, or chocolate, or other substances? Um, and then it has challenge tests, cognitive tests, memory, you know, um, performance, sight, vision, standard tests that are associated with age-related neurodegeneration. And so I popularized this formula, and I called it the stamina stack. And I called it the stamina stack because I got so tired of people ripping off my ideas, claiming it as their own, and popularizing it. So I said, OK, I've got to brand this thing. I'll just call it the stamina stack. So here is the stamina stack. You're welcome to take a photograph of it. The niacin amount is just sub-threshold for flushing. Some people like the niacin flush, but most people do not. So there is a 10th to a 20th theogram of Slosby cubensis. Lion's mane mycelium, not the fruit bodies. The mycelium contains aranacines that promote nerve growth factors. And, and so and it turns out that those people who stacked, and this, this cohort was about 4,500 people were stacked. Of 4,500 people were non-stackers, 4,200 people were stackers. Now, the amazing thing about the microdose study is that we had more non-microdosers than we had microdosers. So the journal editors at Nature liked this because the two populations were very well weighted in their analysis. So we published our first paper, also in Nature, Scientific Reports. This time, 3,486 uh, uh, reporters. And 28%, 264 people were using the stamina stack who are microdosing. So that was interesting. The stack became so popular. And we found very strong signal of reducing depression and anxiety. 
with the people who are doing the stamina stack and with also microdosers, the data is very similar, data from more than 8,000 participants. But we came under scrutiny and criticism, and I understand this, well, you're interpreting an emotional state by microdosing, which is subjective. Well, that's what the clinical studies were doing also, by the way. But how do you know it's not a community response because you joined a community of individuals, I'm microdosing, you're microdosing, we're all microdosing, we have a community, we feel better, don't we? So yeah, it's, it's very interpretive. So I ask, don't we have a metric in our microdose.me app that's beyond subjectivity, that actually shows a performance enhancement? And our statistician said, yes, we do. And so we dug into what's called the finger tapping test. Many of you have had this if you have traumatic brain injury, you know, relatives, Alzheimer's or dementia, how many times you can tap your two fingers in 10 seconds? It's a psychomotor test. 100 articles plus on basically the tap test. You can tap a lot faster when you're 22 than you're 82. Same with playing the piano, the guitar, etc. And so when we disambiguated the stamina stackers, from the microdosers or non-microdosers without the stamostat, we found an extraordinary signal. And we also published this in Nature. What we found in the 55 plus year olds, the tapping frequency of psychomotor performance went from 48 taps to 68 taps in 30 days. That's not subjective. That's not an emotional state. This is a performance enhancement Think of the implications of how many elderly people fall, break their hip, go to the hospital, get an infection, and die. Think of all the people trying to teach the younger generation how to play the piano or a guitar. Think about older people trying to code with their fingers. Six regions of the brain, at least, are involved in performing a tap test. Ideation, looking at it, performance, touch sequence, cadence, that whole entire response. So we got really excited by this data. And now we've been able to locate neuroreceptors and we found the entourage effect of these ingredients is greater than the cumulative addition of the three components by itself causing synergy. I think we've come up with a breakthrough. All of us suffer from neurodegeneration. It's an age-related phenomenon. This could have the universality of use to improve psychomotor performance across all of your activities a day. What activity are you not involved in the psychomotor performance? So I postulated this would be activating a receptor site called TRAC-B. TRAC-B is a neuroreceptor that codes for BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factors. I postulated this about seven or eight years ago. I was so excited when an article in Cell that came out, authored by I think 20, more than 20 scientists, found that SSRIs and antidepressants work because they bind with the track B neuroreceptor. That's the reason why they work. And this past year, another article came out with a lot of other co-authors saying that psilocybin back, uh, binds to that neuroreceptor a thousand times more than antidepressants, a thousand times more. That's a macrodose, a thousand times more than an antidepressant. Where's a microdose? It's somewhere on that slope now, isn't it? It's gonna be more than one. This is the biggest threat to big pharma, is the use of psilocybin mushrooms for microdosing for depression. This is a paradigm shifting potential breakthrough, not only for microdosing for depression, but using the stamina stack for coordination. So my bottom line theory is niacin is a catalyst for psilocybin. It aids vascular delivery. Lower doses of psilocybin and tryptamines can be used, augmented by niacin and lion's mane. And the entourage effect allows for the psychomotor performance. 
I filed a patent on July 23, 2016. Six patents have been issued in the past year on this data. Some of you know about patents are method patents. And a method patent does not give you much protection. A method patent for iPhone, you can't see the way it was made in a private factory. My patents are blends of composition of matter patents, where then the iPhone is proof of the patent. So Mycomedica, I love it because Tom showed all those companies involved in the psilocybin space were never mentioned. We have been under the radar. We raised $60 million. We still have $53 million in the bank. The psilocybin industry has been boom and bust, as many of you know. So many companies start up and then failed. And we've just taken the Aikido approach, remaining in stealth mode. Our patent portfolio, as of yesterday, increased to nine patents. We're coming out of stealth mode. We have several clinical studies planned for 2024. I think we're at a cusp of a medical breakthrough in psychiatry and neurology. A popular way of making these microdoses of a chocolate. We learned this from the Aztecs. Now, even though I have a DEA license, I live mostly in Canada on a remote island in Desolation Sound, British Columbia. Under our physician's supervision, legally, I consume psilocybin mushrooms about twice a year. And I was with my physician attendant, and I'm eating psilocybin cubensis, and I start gagging. And she, she was like, you're a psilocybin expert. I go, these are terrible. I hate the taste of these. But you put it with chocolate, and they're delectable. So thanks to the Aztecs, two-eyed seeing. Thank you, Aztecs, for teaching us. The psilocybin mushrooms are much better when you can buy it with chocolate. So I think the stamina stack can increase neurological health of the peripheral and central nervous system throughout the entire body. How many Einsteins are we losing? All these references that I mentioned is at an unbranded website that I've constructed with my team at mushroomreferences.com. There's no advertisements, just for scientists, just for researchers. Hundreds of articles on mycelium showing that it's active and has properties that are beneficial. It's more than a thousand pages long, I think, now. We populate it about once a month, repopulate it. How many Einsteins are we losing? And our elders that need to pass the torch of knowledge to the next generation. This is critical for the body intellect of our society. Macrodosing with therapy is absolutely essential. My father, at the end of his life, asked me for psilocybin mushrooms. I turned him down. Alexander Smith, that I showed you at the beginning of my talk, the father of American mycology, who published a monograph on the genus Psilocybe, never ate the psilocybin mushrooms himself. In Aspen, Colorado, where he had a house, he invited me over for a private conversation with his wife. And he says, Paul, I respect you. I want to do psilocybin mushrooms with you. I'm 24 years of age. I asked both Alexander Smith, my father, the same question. Helen and Mona, their wives, will you also ingest psilocybin mushrooms with us? And they both said no. And I gave them the same answer. I cannot take the responsibility of giving you a high dose of psilocybin mushrooms and the next day that I leave, I'll be abandoning you. You can have a life-changing experience and you to reconcile that it challenges everything that you previously believed in. I feel a deep responsibility for that. So long ago, I adopted the mantra, nature provides, I don't. That's probably why I passed my DEA background check. I've been very strict about this. Those of you who convey psilocybin mushrooms to other people, you have a 
moral responsibility to be skilled, to be with them subsequent to the experience. There are skilled therapists. CIIS, the California Institute for Integrative Studies, is graduating thousands of therapists now. They can be contacted for local therapists in your area. I'm advocating you only do this legally, or it's legally available. But there's a sea change here, folks. This is a revolution for the freedom of consciousness. The ballot measures are overwhelmingly positive, and the politicians left and right. Conservatives and liberals are coming together advocating the use of psychedelics and psilocybin for veterans and for PTSD. This also is an example of two-eyed seeing. I may be left to the center in my political and environmental beliefs, but from the many years of being involved in mycological societies, I've met some great conservatives who are fast, true friends of mine. And I've come to realize those of us who are liberal, we push the envelope of change. We're risk takers. 95% of the time we'll fail. At 5% of the time, maybe 1% of the time, we'll innovate and create an invention that will help the commons. And then conservatives don't risk, want to risk change. They want to then keep things stable. I come from a family of wheat farmers. They dare not change their practices. They want to stay with the tried and true methods. So it's interesting that the innovators out of the left field bring into the commons something that conservatives then later protect. We need conservatives and liberals to work together. We need different cultures to work together. We need two-eyed seeing. I believe psilocybin increases neurogenesis. I believe psilocybin reduces violence, crime, recidivism. The return on the investment to society can be calculated in the billions of dollars by reducing the number of people going into prison, reducing the stress on the court system, reducing the collateral damage of an opioid addict breaking into your home and stealing things or causing violence to, form, to supply their addiction. I have a family member who spent three years in prison. because of opioid use. I did not understand him. He was suffering real pain. Those of you who are not experienced with these addicts, they are experiencing pain. Their endogenous dopamine receptors are not activated normally. They need the medicine to suppress their pain. Without it, they experience severe pain. This is something now like a pebble in the pond of good news. When you can break these addictive behaviors, become less, less violent, a better citizen, less prone to breaking the laws, compassionate, reaching the hand out to help your neighbors, a core Christian belief, and a belief with many religions, Judaism, Islamic traditions, all of these, do unto each other that which you want to be done to yourselves. This is a paradigm-shifting medicine at a time critical that we need to come together. I believe psilocybin makes nicer people. And we are at a critical junction in time. We're at the tipping point. Unless we can unify and come together as a community, we cannot address the challenges that are we're not on the near event horizon. They're happening now. But that community, the body intellect that we can protect and preserve and demonstrate, I think can create the paradigm shift listening to our ancestors and listening to future generations, calling back to us. This is our moment in time.
This is our responsibility. So as a community in the natural products industry, let's not create a circular firing squad shooting at each other, inventing false narratives. This is time to us to come together in collaboration and unity and polite, respectful competition. We can do this together. I believe the natural products industry can lead the charge of this paradigm shift in the revolution and freedom of consciousness. Thank you very much. Let's have a big hand. If that doesn't deserve a standing ovation, I don't know what does. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Changing the world.